Okay, I have a complex confession to make. I am one of these. I didn't know I was one of these by that definition until about the middle of this week. That's the first time I saw that. And it was kind of an interesting way that I encountered it. I saw a YouTube video where a woman was repenting of being one of these and asking for forgiveness from her feminist friends for being one of these. This is what it is. Complementarianism is a theological view in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam that men and women have different but complementary, and that's where the title comes from, complementary roles and responsibilities in marriage, family life, and religious leadership. The word complementary and its cognates are currently used to denote this view. I am convinced that this is God's intent. The men and women, while having slightly different roles, would have complementary roles. And I have mixed emotions about building a sermon around a day. So like Mother's Day, Father's Day, that kind of thing. I have mixed emotions about that. I've done it both ways. I've had Mother's Day type sermons on Mother's Day and intentionally chose other topics on Mother's Day. But this happened and I thought, okay, I'll kind of tie this in. You might recognize this text. Yahweh God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper corresponding to him, suitable, complementary, a partner, as we will see. Yahweh God had formed out of the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called each living soul, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper corresponding to him, suitable for him. Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at its spot. And Yahweh God built the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. The man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is why man will leave his father and mother and will join with his wife, and they will become one flesh. Our civilization, especially Western culture, has undertaken some very dramatic changes in my lifetime. I am aware that there were changes prior to that, but it's an exponential curve. But the changes were fairly gradual over thousands of years and then have just gone rampant change to the point where half of Western culture is completely puzzled at the totally illogical ideas of the other half of Western culture. And they're scared to death about how is this going to work? How can you completely deny what's obviously real and justify pretending and call that reality? 
And the scripture talks a lot about those who call evil good and good evil and how God hates that. So this topic is inseparable from the changes, the transformations that we see in civilization around us. And it's absolutely crucial that we cling to a godly truth. And there's a purpose that God has in mind for this method, this system, this process that he intentionally established. Jesus said, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Notice Christ's language here isn't that he made them male and female, which sadly is what a lot of people believe. But his language here indicates that it's God, a third party to Jesus that made them, and it's crucial that we see that Jesus acknowledges only two categories, male and female. He goes on to say, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Do we see any of that being contradicted in modern culture? Sadly, yes. Right after the flood, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is a crucial element of God's plan. Why? What's God's end game? We're going to see texts that explain in great detail what God intends for his creation for his entire plan. There's a purpose. And part of that purpose is this concept of men and women becoming one and replenishing the earth, multiplying. And there's instructions for what they're supposed to do with those children, how they're supposed to train those children. This is kind of an obscure text. Might not think of at first of using this text in this topic. This is from Malachi 2, verse 13. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of Yahweh with tears, with weeping, and with groaning because he no longer pays attention to the offering nor receives it with favor from your hand. God isn't listening to these people, and they're crying about it. Yet you say, why? Because Yahweh has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. Though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant, did he not make you one, although he had the residue of the Spirit? Why one? He sought a godly seed. God wants men and women to produce godly children because that's what he wants around him. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. And in this context, and in most scriptural contexts, spirit is your attitudes, your values, your thinking, your identity. It's who you are. 
It's the way you think. It's your worldview. There's a hot spirit. There's a cool spirit. There's a sad spirit we read in the Sunday school lesson that Hannah had a sad spirit. Then she had a joyful spirit. It's, it's all those aspects of your mentality. Take heed to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For I hate divorce, says Yahweh, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garments with violence. And it's my observation that one of the most violent actions humans can take against each other is the divorce process. It's horrible. Says Yahweh of armies, or Lord of hosts, as we talked about this morning. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God holds this arrangement very important in his, his spirit, his grasp of what is just, what is righteous, what is good. In the faith chapter, I wanted you to notice that there are a number of times that women are specified in this text. Through faith also, Sarah said, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. We call this the faith chapter. And this is partially to answer those who are harshly critical of scripture that it's very male dominant. And if you count the verses that talk to a man, he, it is predominantly directed to a masculine individual but predominantly doesn't cover the whole thing. It is absolutely important that we note how the scriptures greatly praise select faithful women, not only, but it's very pointed. And we were talking this morning about Hannah, and I had forgotten about her in the preparation for this. But what a tremendous example, profoundly faithful and deep. Very, very good example. Sarah, same thing. Why didn't Sarah and Abraham have children at 30? God fully intended for them to have children. Why did he make them wait till they were as good as dead? Is what it says here in Hebrews 11. I haven't read that part, but uh, that is in the, the context here. From one as good as dead. A very important offspring was produced. That was part of God's plan. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. This is a crucial clue to God's plan, the point isn't 
how you die and how old you were when you died in this life. The point is, which resurrection are you going to qualify for? Are you going to obtain the better resurrection or the not better resurrection? And I made a note here, we could also mention Abigail, who was a great example of wisdom and restraint. Saved David from some embarrassing situation and became his wife, Ruth. Great example of profound faith. Esther, that's, that'd make a great movie. If you, if you as an adult read the book of Esther and understand all the nuances and everything behind the scenes, it's an incredible story. Could be gory, depending on how the movie was made, but it would be amazing. And Hannah, and there's, there's lots of them. Proverbs talks a lot about mothers. It's fairly repetitive, so I apologize for that. But I just wanted to point out how many times the book of Proverbs talks about mothers. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Is the scripture anti-women? No. This advice says, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but the righteous, <coughs> but righteousness delivereth from death. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. He that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother is a son that causes shame and bringeth reproach. And this was one of the big criticisms Jesus had with not only the condition in Israel around him, but the leadership that was condoning it, that they weren't taking care of their parents and they were justifying it. But how much importance do we see the scriptures putting on this relationship? Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Maybe not in this life, but absolutely, conclusively, as a final judgment. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth the wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that beareth thee or bear thee shall rejoice. Whoso robbeth his father or his mother and saith, It's no transgression. The same is the companion of a destroyer. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Another key ingredient of God's plan for mothers and fathers, that this unit is supposed to reprove and give wisdom to the children. God desires godly seed. He desires this partnership, this complementary partnership to produce heirs for his promises. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. 
The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagle shall eat it. A little gruesome, but a pretty powerful point and strong encouragement for this partnership, this complementary partnership that God designed and ordered. There's a whole chapter in Proverbs dedicated to the excellent wife, the excellent woman. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband, the spirit of her husband, trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. I never know what my wife is going to come home with. <laughs> And it's good. She rises also while it's still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. Busy. She considers a field and buys it. Is this a subjugated woman? A dominated woman? Is that what the scriptures ever teach? They do observe that at times. Nabal seemed to certainly be abusive until he died. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. Pat can tell you what those are. <laughs> she extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Why? How would he have time to do that? Well, because he's got a great partner. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Now, I don't think that every great wife is doing each one of these things specifically. But this is showing you a pattern. It's showing you a type. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she smiles at the future. Remember in our Sunday school lesson, when Hannah started smiling. When the future opened up, looked pretty bright. But this is pretty optimistic. This is not a cranky grouch. This is somebody who's optimistic. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. So this, this text is both complementary and educational. This is instructing how to accomplish this, and it's acknowledging the marvel of that accomplishment. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears Yahweh, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Wonderful text. 
very uplifting, very instructional, very complimentary, very supportive. Here's another <coughs> explanation of God's overall intent. <coughs> For you are all sons of God or children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I'm firmly convinced that verse 28 is not denying that those categories exist, but it's pointing out that those categories are irrelevant when it comes to being children of God. They're not irrelevant as far as our roles. Those roles are essential in producing God's intent. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. What promise? We pointed out many times that right across the road here is reality. There's a cemetery and nobody escapes that. There is one tiny, tiny exception for those who happen to be Christ's at his second coming. But other than that, Everybody is going to die. The, the crux of the matter, the real issue is there's a promise, a promise of resurrection, a promise of one of those resurrections being to eternal life, to glory, as a reward, as an inheritance and one of them being to judgment and destruction. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. In 2 Corinthians 6, the next letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, verse 16, and what agreement does God's temple have with idols? For we, are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from the midst of them, the all other forms of idolatry, whether you're worshiping science, or you're worshiping Buddha, or you're worshiping any other thing, yourself, pleasure, all kinds of things that are ungodly, that the scriptures are God's word calling us out of those things. Come out from the midst of them and be separate, says the Lord. And stop touching anything unclean, and I will welcome you. I will be to you a father, and you will be to me sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's why he's done all of this. is because he wants sons and daughters. Could God have created flawless people? When you look at the, the programming that's in the DNA of his creation, I've mentioned several times that I was watching a nature video when this really kind of hit me not for the first time, but I definitely was an impact. One day old baby ducks, the mother quacks and the ducks all line up and fly out of a nest about 20 feet off the ground. 
This is a specific kind of duck, European wood duck, I think. But they fly and they just spread eagle. How many muscle groups are engaged in a bird that spreads everything, the webbed feet, tails, wings. When you, when you look at how a child learns to walk and compare that to that kind of functionality at one day old, and they all did it. And they just kind of drifted down, landed on the ground, got up, walked, followed the mother down to the pond and swam along behind her and would come back to her when she quacked. How much programming is that? How does that compare with human beings? What does that have to do with anything in the sermon? Well, God's got a plan. <laughs> God's designed this whole world in which we live on purpose. Human beings have to nurture infants for years until they develop the, the skills and the spirit, the thinking, the values, all of the elements of becoming a child of God and becoming a functional human being, able to work, able to think, able to do enough math to figure out, I make a hundred bucks and my rent is 75, all of those things that are part of life. God could have created human beings with all that knowledge already, but instead he set up the program that we see around us. <laughs> where men and women are instinctively compelled to get together and to have children. And that God's instructions are for those two to stay together and raise those children appropriately. When we went through that entire list in Proverbs, there's a whole lot of instruction and law and commandments going on within that family unit. God's got a plan. He's got an end game in mind. And it's that he wants to have sons and daughters. And he wants to provide for them a marvelous inheritance. <laughs> There's a wonderful inheritance. As little kids, we learn, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And in Revelation 20, it talks of 21, it talks about God wants to have sons and daughters to inherit his perfected earth. Let's conclude with a song. Morning services with song number 284. Rising, O thou great Jehovah. 284. Please stand as you sing.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time that you have allowed us to get together and praise and worship you, to enjoy fellowship together, to discuss the things in your word. We thank you for your words of truth and wisdom, our hope and righteousness. Help us to glean the understanding that you desire for us to have so that we might be able to please you and to be a light to those around us. We ask that you would bless us as we go from here, that you would guide our footsteps so that we might bring others closer to you and that we might fulfill your words. We ask for a place in that glorious kingdom you have promised, and we ask that you would send Jesus soon to establish that kingdom. In his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.